fun off of our group. Um, Pete Williams, he's the co other co-chair of the SQL group. Uh, Phil Milner and Gary Polinski, the chairman of the BI group, both have uh, unavoidable work conditions right now uh, today and weren't able to make the meeting. You know, it's difficult when you're one of the few people who are CPA to work with the company and something happens. Um, we are part of the PATH community, Professional Association of Civil Servers. Uh, today, I already introduced uh, Carrie Frost from Modus, who's our sponsor. We really appreciate him sponsoring the lunch. Um, we're going to have Kevin Bellow do the SSAS dimensional modeling measures and advanced features, and then Kevin Shine, who's going to do the SSAS our conditioning strategy. Um, out on the table is an evaluation sheet, uh, the last evaluation sheet, get a raffle ticket. I have a referral site code, um, a product from <coughs> Intelligence Manager from my era, uh, various uh, IT t-shirts, and I think I have an Amazon gift card. I'll just double check on uh, There's also a handout on the table that's uh, for what's coming up with the calendar. So we have this listed the SQL group right now is March 14th. John Messer, who is our liaison with Microsoft, who's giving one of the speeches. Uh, he's going to be unavailable on the 14th. So right now, it's tentative for the 28th, but we will let you know as soon as possible. So it's still a Tuesday. It would just be the last Tuesday of the month. And it's all going to be about demystifying Azure and uh, SQL Server in the cloud. Okay. <laughs> Wow. So the past community, uh, we have local groups and there's virtual groups. Uh, we also, there's a conference once a year. It's in October in Seattle, and they still have some uh, past summit items for 2016. Virtual chapters, uh, you would just take your past login and associate with the virtual chapter. You'll get emails about their meetings. They're usually lunch and learn. And they're on different topics, and there's just a large number of virtual chapters. So, EBA Fundamentals, PowerShell, Women in Technology, High Availability, Staff Recovery. You know, you can listen to these. Uh, if you're, uh, the advantage of doing the lunch and learn is uh, you can ask questions. And if not, uh, they're all recorded and posted on the, the individual virtual chapter website on their archive. There's more there coming up. This is a list one. This is just a selection of what's available. There's cloud, this is intelligence, analytics, security. You know, there's a really good subset. People Saturdays are one-day mini conference. We had ours in September over at St. Louis. It's an opportunity to attend, you know, a, a one-day conference and to only be involved initially for the lunch. Uh, some of the uh, Saturdays are now having free conference to go for class the day before the day after. Uh, how is coming up March 11th, so that's kind of in our area. And we're still deciding on if we can uh, do a single Saturday for this coming year. There's a lot of opportunities to volunteer with CAP. And here's uh, the information. So uh, here's the information on Kevin. He's a database developer who turned into the academic CBA and then decided to build the I solution. <laughs> He's been working with the Microsoft AI for over 10 years and has a passion for business intelligence. Kevin has Protected numerous successful solutions within the manufacturing, finance, and healthcare industry. Most recently, he can be found tinkering with R programming and IoT. We just did an evening lecture on R. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. So Kevin, this is Kevin's background. He's a 
be doing uh, the SSS data. Uh, he's a full stack CI architect. <laughs> so he's going to be the second lecture, and then we'll go uh, and have the wrap up Turn on the mic. Two Kevins today, so you'll get everything you need to know. Uh, so, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Kevin Blue. I work for MCA Connect. We're a Microsoft partner, uh, concentrating in Dynamics. Uh, however, I also work in Infor, Oracle, Bond, DB2, pretty much any system uh, out there. I have uh, queried both from two design data warehouses and data modeling, which is what the topic of today is. Uh, a little bit of background. I think I can pretty much get this. Ten years in the field. I've uh, done governmental uh, accounting, about 40 implementations. Healthcare, I think I'm up to five. Manufacturing, 10 or so. Usually oil and gas. Uh, process manufacturing, lean manufacturing. I've done a lot of those systems as well. And I'm a Microsoft certified professional. A little bit about my company, my, uh, my little plug. Um, we're a Microsoft partner. We actually won Industry uh, Partner of the Year 2013. This is actually a little old now. Uh, and one CRM partner in 2015. So we are very closely tied with Microsoft. Some of our customers. Uh, Dell and Shell are two that I, I personally work with. And let's get into material. So what is SAP? Who's heard of SAP before in this room? I'm expecting quite a few people. Is everyone pretty much a DBA, database developer? Data architect, very interactive. I try to read everyone so I know what to go, what to cover, what not to cover. So show of hands, architect, CBA. Perfect. Data model. So what is that? Microsoft Online uh, Analytical Processing Tool um, in SQL Server.
giant conceptual twist if you come from a normal database development background. This is usually the hardest part I have with anyone that comes to work with me, is you're doing a mind shift. You've been told for how many years, OLTP, third normal form. The normal hub, normalize, normalize, normal, third, third normal form. I am now telling you to forget all that. Some blanks there. Right? Throw everything you've done the last five years out. Okay. So let's, let's look at this. So we have a uh, sales rep. Let's look at them sales rep. Let's look at both of them, and I don't have an F gate. What have we done here? Top is our OLTC, bottom is our uh, denom. So we have now flattened this out. We have now rolled the manager into another column. Simple query. So how much easier is it going to be to query the bottom results for a particular manager and see which sales reps report to them? By, by what do I call it, region? By region. What sales reps are applicable for a region? How much easier is that? Going back to the initial point I made, what happens if uh, Richard Little changes his sales rep ID? Does it, will it affect my query? No, because I've used this surrogate key. So you're abstracting data from your ERP system, trying to plan for the future, and removing joins. I no longer have to join this data together. Let me illustrate this by grabbing products. I have a product table. I have a products category table. I have a products subcategory table. Again, very standard. This would allow me to add categories, then to apply to a subcategory, and then to apply to a product. You can almost see this on your ERP screen as you're creating a product. Yeah, so I want to select this product, I need to add one. I'm going to select from this drop down list. These are your tables. I would then have to join three tables to query this data. So let's put it in an OLAP dimensional model, which I happen to have. Uh, I'm going to forego the sub, uh, forego this one. So we can fit everything on the screen. What have I done? I've joined the three tables into a product and rolled them up into the hierarchies. Now, again, I could query by the category, subcategory, product ID. And if the product ID changes, if we do a renaming, uh, initiative, which I've faced as a, as a full-time manufacturing architect. We renamed all of our part IDs. How much fun is that? Um, very easy on the warehouse, very hard on the ERP. Uh, so you're seeing the benefit of flattening the table, denormalizing the data. Again, for read. Query, uh, query speed for read, simplistic for joints. There's, there's very little joints that will be done, actually, on this particular table. Straightforward enough? Okay. So, now let's go into cubes. So, at this point, I have designed a ETL that will extract data from my ERP. I would have put this data into a, a data warehouse or a data mark, depending on the size we want. There's different approaches for that. In a dimensional model, a flattened table, an OLAP structure. So what do I do with that now? I could query it directly. I could put Excel right against it. Um, could. Or I can include cubes, which will give the benefit of a, a WYSIWYG, does everyone familiar with that term? A drag and drop ability for my end users. I'm now taking my IT initiative and making a business initiative by allowing my business users to benefit from our, our, hard, and, our hard work that we've done. So. I have launched, uh, launched into Visual Studio, this is 2015, and I've already set everything up. I prefer to have everything in front of you while we talk about it uh, than, than try to uh, do a live demo. When we create an analysis queue, we have two options. We have multidimensional and tabular. What I've opted for today, for other reasons you'll see in a little bit, is a multidimensional. I'll circle back on the two different types once we've discussed this one. First thing we need to do in any uh, <clears throat> multi-dimensional cube is to define the data source, the DS. It is the demo database we discussed earlier. So, no, it's right there. 
I simply made a connection to my database. I then can divide the data uh, source view, which is what you're looking at here, to say what tables I'm going to pull in. Now, the tables I've selected are the tables we already reviewed, date, sales, sales rep, product. Slightly different. They want to know it's something different about the naming convention. We're, not, we're missing BIM. We're missing FAST. We're, vis we're missing very technical terms that might mean something to an architect or a database developer or a DBA, but will just confuse the business user. What's DIM? What's this DIM sales rep? Well, you can start seeing the benefit here of analysis cubes. We have our table, DIM sales rep, but we have our friendly name as sales rep. So the entire premise of a cube, multidimensional, is to give the business users a method to query the data and slice the data in a friendly, intuitive method. That might not mean the configuration for us, IT folk, is uh, necessarily as straightforward, but that's the angle. We're, we're serving our company. So you can see that the uh, model I'm actually pulled in based on four keys. I put in the dimensional model. I have my, my sales in the middle, surrounded by my dimensions. So right off the bat, I know that I'm going to be able to slice sales by a date, slice sales by sales rep, and slice sales by product. The date dimension is a very big uh, cornerstone of all warehousing. Everything has a date fault, with very few exceptions. Think of your ERP system. You have an invoice. It's got an invoice date. You want to query that in a SQL, a SQL database. I want you to tell me all sales for the first quarter and third quarter. What do you have to do? Date part. You're going to have to change that date to a date part, query the date part, then return it. Now I want you to do the second and third quarter. Well, i got to rewrite your query. Using a, dim, a dimensional date will give you, again, the ability to simply query where the where clause the count. So I have calendar, quarter, number. I would say where in one and three. One and four, two and three. I have the names. I have uh, holidays. So this can go to a, 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 an HR system. Are we going to be working that day? If I'm doing MRP, are we going to be in the office because it's a holiday to make that product? I actually have a client um, where I put a report together using something very similar to this that says you have a scheduled product line that's going to be shipping. Well, they were actually saying, well, I'm going to work Friday eight hours to get this product out. Well, Friday's a holiday. Didn't they were full of that. That's what will be implemented. We can also continue this, extend this to multiple calendars. Right now, we have one calendar date. Invoice date is a fiscal date. It happens 214. Is that the second period of the fiscal year? Is that the second period of calendar year? We can add these to a dim date. I could easily have the full date represent 2.14, the actual date, but then have a calendar year period, a fiscal year period, a shipping calendar period. These are all things we can add to this, and that will allow you to move between them uh, just by dragging and dropping a new field. Questions on that? that? That's usually a big big help for manufacturing. Usually you have a two or three day lag at the end of the month where you uh, go to the next period. So once we have our data um, brought into the analysis service, we need to design our dimensions, and specifically our hierarchy. So dimensions. New dimension will give you a blank sheet. What I've done here is I've brought over the applicable fields for the report for today. I literally can just add, let's add suffix, new attributes to columns. I'm selecting from a uh, bucket of fields and adding them to my attributes on the left side. The goal of which is to then build a hierarchy to allow for drill down, roll up, cross querying uh, at the end product, which will be an Excel or a Power BI product. To build a hierarchy, in this case I have two, just year and month, you simply drag to create a new hierarchy. So that's a one level hierarchy. <coughs> two level hierarchy. I have created a hierarchy that has two levels, but they're not related. The system doesn't know that year goes to month or month goes to year. We do, but the system doesn't. Attribute relationships is the method when you start exploring with this to 
uh, relate those different fields that you've just dragged in. You can see what I've done already. I hope I didn't change that. Calendar month, the calendar year. Goes from left to right, lowest range to highest. So dates go into months, months go into years. Could I add a, could I add quarter? Absolutely. Just didn't apply to my report I was putting together for today. Let me go back here. I'm going to delete this uh, secondary hierarchy put together. Same thing for product. I have taken products, brought over the fields that are applicable, so uh, category, subcategory, and product ID, or SK in this case, put them in the hierarchy, rename the hierarchy, and so forth. Sales rep has three levels, director, manager, and the full name. Anyone catch the full name? I don't have full name in my data set. That is a calculated column. Let me go back. If I look at sales reps here, I have personal last name. I have title, region, manager, and director. I do not have a full name. Now, we're fastly approaching a, uh, a point of uh, discussion among data warehouse architects. Where should we do this work? Should we do it in our ETL layer? Should we do it at the cube layer, the SSA cube? Should we do it at the reporting layer? I want to, in this case, concatenate two fields. Where should that work be done? You know, like this, as, as IT guys, it depends, right? It always depends. My personal preference is to try to push it as far, uh, as, as fast towards the warehouse as possible, unless there's a reason to expose on the reporting layer to push it towards the end user. I want to do a lot of the work on the IT to make the business user uh, experience uh, as streamlined as possible. Again, we're, we're, we're helping our business here. That's the whole purpose of these projects. So why did I do it in the queue? Well, maybe I am the business intelligence architect, and there is a separate database administrator or data warehouse architect, and they break everything up to the fields there in the ERP system. They want to have a one-to-one -one mapping, which I usually get requests from my clients, to say where this field comes from in the ERP system. I have a dim sales rep. It comes from uh, Salesforce data, this field. So they have a, they, can, they can put the linear trace on it. So maybe that data warehouse architect will not add these together in the, air, uh, in the ETL for me. I have to handle it on my side. So how do we do that? If I go back to my data source field, and let me kind of move things around here. You can see I have the field full name. And there's a little icon, a calculator, a calculated field. Very simple to put together using some uh, standard SQL language. I go to properties here, and down on the properties window. My expression is first name, SQL language, plus single quote, single quote, single space, last name. Could I have done it the other way and done a last name, comma, first? Absolutely, just for example. We can do this can generate these additional columns of data at the data source view level. So as soon as we pull the data into a, the analysis queue, I can add these columns. I could do some simple math. Now, the question I usually get now is on the sales side. Gross sales, discount rate, net sales. What if I didn't have net sales? How would I generate that? I would take gross sales minus the discount percentage plus freight. That was my, my net sales. Should I do that here? Should I create, calculate columns the same way I would do in Excel, column A plus column B minus column C, where I'm talking metrics, where I'm talking dollars and cents? My answer is no. You'll see why shortly. Think about what we're doing here. We're saying for every record that we pull in, we're doing a calculation. What did I say about cubes? It's for readability, it's performance. Do I want to be doing a calculation every time a record is read? No. Pushing us back to all TC, our ERP system might as well just write TC equal code. So what's the solution to this? Analysis cubes have what we call measures, in memory on the fly reporting. It's sort of like the windowing function in SQL Server. Is everyone familiar with that? The windowing function, row, row number, very similar, on the fly. The other advantage is now that we have a uh, 
an infrastructure, say so SSH a cube, we can take we can take advantage of compression, predetermined aggregations, um, which basically allows us to say we're going to sum up by a sales rep the gross sales. Let's have this cube process that data at a time, so when we query it, it's already calculated. I don't need to do ad hoc queries. We're taking advantage of prepping them. So let's look at the cube. You'll see that the cube is very similar to the data source view with the exception of now we're color coding. We have blue and yellow. Yellow are my fact tables. They contain measures, the metrics that we're trying to capture. In this case, gross sales, uh, discount, freight, and I think I got sales down there yet. So, what are our measures? Measures are how we tell SSAS that we're going to track, in this case, gross sales, and we're going to aggregate by sum. So when I do a report in Excel and I do a pivot table, I will want to see the grand sum, the grand total of the sale by whatever dimensional slices I have. May a date, be a sales rep, product, I think it's the other one I have with this. Product, I want to see the sum. We have tons of different options here. Counter rows. This goes back to the uh, uh, phone, uh, call code. I want to see the number of, uh, just the strict count. I'm not going to aggregate how many count, how many calls we got today. Just count them. Minimum, maximum. What's the high water mark today? What was the highest duration of that call center today? What was the low duration? Who was the quickest? Who was the longest? That will tell you which, uh, which I, 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 my brother was in the call center, so how long people are staying on the phone, because I know they're trying to get on the phone and get off the phone. Average over time, a moving average. First empty non uh, first non uh, empty value. Maybe we don't have a complete data set. I want to find the most the, the first record that's populated. We can use these as measures. These will pre aggregate. The system will store this information. So when we run the report in Excel, we don't take the time to, to go find those records. Another advantage of cubes. Now. This is another example here. We're just summing. I might want to change this. I'm getting into live demo now. Uh, let's say the maximum discount. Who gave the biggest discount? Gonna, as a sales manager, I'm going to go find that sales rep and ask them why. Did you give a 35% discount when our margin is 10? I might put this in. So let, me put, I mean, uh, let me go ahead and do that. Now, Visual Studio, we've now built our queue. We have a good structure. How do we deploy this? Where is this deployed to? It deploys to SQL Server. You can access this through Management Studio. I should finish. You can see all three fields we have. Now, does it have to be on the same server? No, it doesn't. Uh, we start getting talking about infrastructure. My recommendation has always been to have a separate SQL server with a separate analysis server and a separate web server for your hosting and reports. So a three-tier, three-server uh, architecture. Kind of changes when we start talking about Azure. I'll leave them. So to deploy this, and cross your fingers I didn't break anything. There's a very small icon up here. A little bit. Yes. It means process. So when we make changes to the cube, we're making them offline in our IDE environment. Processing will then push this data back up to the cube, and you'll see any time any time a uh, BI architect is developing, we're constantly hitting process because we want to see the data up in the cube to then expose the reporting layer the most recent version of our cube. So I'm going to hit the process. Server component seems to be out of date. That's absolutely correct. We just made a change. And uh, there are build errors, so again, that's why you don't do live demo. So, uh, yeah, the write back partition, so I'm going to leave that alone because that's coming up for my next topic here. So, what else do we have? That's the 100, 150 level of, uh, of SSAS cubes. What else can we do? We have brought in data, we have modeled the data, we have our measures, 
I could use this right now, um, but what else can we do? What's the next step? What's the deep dive portion of, uh, portion of this? Well, the deep dive is now we start talking about KPIs, calculations, and partitions. So what is a KPI? Key performance indicator. It is something I'm trying to track, but the business has told me it's very important. This is an overly simplistic approach, but it kind of tells me who's doing very well and who's doing very bad sales-wise. Still useful for a sales manager. So in this case, I have a value. What am I quantifying, which is, in this case, gross sales? And you can start seeing a little different language context here. This is what we call MDS language, multidimensional expression language. I am now referring to a measure group. So I had gross sales. I had, uh, what I have, discount, freight. Those are all measures within the measures group. I am quantifying this value. I'm setting a goal artificially at 20,000. I could have another field on my table that maybe has a goal for each person. I don't in my data set, so I just put 20,000. And then I have my, my, uh, my status. Well, how am I going to uh, uh, identify if the sale is good, bad, or in the middle of the road? Simple case statement will do this. We have case we have measures. So in this case, I'm saying uh, when the measure is greater than 25,000, it's a one. This is a traffic light. There's three options, one, zero, and minus one, green, yellow, red. I'm saying, hey, if you did more than 25,000 in sales, good job. You, you met your goal. You're above your goal. If you're between 20,000 and 25,000, you're, uh, uh, you're yellow. You're close. And if you're below that, your minus one should be red. So now we're, putting, we're starting to put visualizations uh, to our data within the queue. Now, KPIs and SSAS have been around for 2005. Um, are there easier ways to do this? Do I have to code things in the queue now? Well, again, we're, we're in the industry, we're, we're, we're approaching a, a point where we're having to reevaluate where we put code, where we're doing the work. Do I put it in the warehouse? Do I put it in ETL? Do I put it in the queue? Do I put it in the reporting layer? This same KPI Hoping I have this saved. I don't. Can also be put right in reporting services. I don't know if anyone's seen 2016 SSRS native mode yet. Has anyone seen this? Yes. We can now embed Power BI natively. And as of end of January, it actually embeds in the web portal now, HTML5, technical release, came out you know, a few weeks ago. I'm actually got a client I'm working with trying to get that going. So I can put KPIs right here. How hard was this to build? Well, new KPI. Is this more intuitive for a business user than putting it in a, uh, an SSA queue? Absolutely. So again, we're having to reevaluate where we as architects are going to put the business logic. Just to show you largest largest scale. So I was saying, I think our, I think I set the goal of three hundred thousand on this one, so we're percent off. Uh, refresh time, manage. Of course, it's going to be uploaded to Power BI online now. You can put onto your mobile phone, um, which I actually do have. I'll show you in a little bit. So again, where am I putting this data? Is SSAS becoming uh, strictly a uh, pre-aggregation tool? No longer the business logic tool. I can't answer that. But because it's a deep dive, here's the KPI. Now, we have different indicators. Traffic light was just an example I picked. We have uh, road signs, gauge, uh, thermometers, a reverse gauge, faces, happy faces, sad faces, frowning faces. These are very similar to what's in Power BI already. So you're seeing a lot of visualizations that Power BI will have that very explicitly mimic what is in SSAS. So it's not one or the other. We're just taking the next version, the, the successor of these KPIs. I will leave this in here because it's in my Excel, and I'll show you. Um, calculations. Now, in my data set, I had a, a record for every sale by product, by sales rep for each state. Well, if I was to look at that data, 
pretty much what I get on my, my show table. I have my sales reps on the left, my date, and I have the dollar amount in the middle. Nothing fancy here. What happens, though, if I want to see, well, I sold 25000 my colleague sold thirty. I want to know my contribution to the total sales. Is that a measure? Am I doing a running total? Not necessarily. Do we have different hierarchies? Am I doing a calculated column? What two columns, A plus B minus C, would I do to generate that data? There really isn't anything. This is the premise for calculations. So, and so far in SSAS, we have measures, calculated columns, KPI, and calculations. Now, I actually have to know what went in here last night for a calculation. I want to know percent of sales. I want to know what each of my sales reps uh, contributed to the overall sales. Maybe this is for my bonus structure. You know, if you're top, top sales, you get a, a hefty bonus. If you're bottom sales, you pay back the company a hefty bonus. Something along those lines. Again, we're looking at MDX language. Uh, sales rep is the dimension, if you recall, the friendly name dimension. It used to be bin sales rep, now it's just sales rep. I am pulling this full name, the calculated column, from that dimension, and I'm grabbing the current member. So, so what is the current member concept? If you visualize the table of sales reps, I think we had 10, maybe 11, and you think about iterating over each one, the one that you're currently on is your current member, whereas the all member, or parent, if I want parent, is the parent dimension, the parent um, grouping. So what are we really saying here is we're saying whatever record you're on, take the gross sales of the measure, remember this is calculated at runtime, again why we don't do this as a calculated column, measure of the gross sales for the current member you're on, divide that by the parent, top level, of all sales. So again, 25,000 versus whatever the total sales are. What we'll see here, you can see my KPI, my nice little traffic light, and my percentage. So my top sales is Jeffrey, no, Jose Paul, right? Yeah. Very useful. Very easy for a business user to simply come over and say, well, I want percentage of sales and gross sales in my KPI. Again, we're doing the work ahead of time to make our business users' um, inquiries streamlined. Now, you see I also have an issue. I, again, I did this last night. Uh, number, I'll handle that later. Grand total, right? That should be zero. Uh, sorry, 100%. Flip it around. So, you can see the advantage of doing this work in SSAS. Now, I want to stop. I want three questions about what I've covered. I just threw a lot at you because I want to actually show you some features that I see my customers really asking for that's going to kind of show you where this is still relevant. Because a lot of my colleagues are looking at us to say yes and going, well, we can, do, we can do different methods now. Do we really want to put it here? I say yes for one reason, one reason only. But before I get to it, I want three questions. Any three? Yes. Do you parameterize the values of the traffic Yes. Yes, you can. It's just MDX query. Um, now, should you though? Your MDX query should be able to work at any level, any hierarchy, any self, the cross-section of the queue. So parameterizing would be a, for what, date ranges maybe? Date ranges or a running balance or API value? Running balance, uh, running balance would just be a measure, Simpl much more simplified. Now you can also put other logic, maybe, um, maybe you have different categories and you want to have different running balances for each category. That would just be an MDX query where you can say, give me the measure gross sales where a product in this certain category, where a parent is, um, I, I don't even remember what my categories are. Let's do sub. Where maybe it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I like golf. Uh, where there's an iron. So you can put that in the query to generate those two measures to do it for you. So you don't have to do this on the reporting side. It's just MDX query. I'll be happy to talk about more about that, but that's a full day session on MDX language. All right, we're one down. Question two. Um, it's always fun to have to do a month, month over month comparison or a rolling six months, month average. Exactly. So let us go to, um, I think I'll be able to get it right here. Let's go to functions, uh, set. Yes. 
I'm just looking for it right now. I remember ancestors and ancestors. So, I don't know which one it is, but the term is pri uh, uh, prior year. I'm forgetting it. Prior year uh, attribute, prior year member. Basically, what it'll do is it'll use uh, the intersection of your current member. So, let's say we're looking at uh, February. We're at February for sales rep Jose, uh, and I want to see his sales this year versus last year. You can actually put that in the language here uh, in one of these functions. I just don't, I can't find it off, off my head right now. And it will actually take that intersection, look at what you want to go back on the year field, that dimension, dim date, go back one and find that value for you. So no longer do you have to query twice, do some CTE manager, uh, SQL Server, you can literally just use it as a function in SSA as, as a measure, and the user will just be able to drag and drop. I think it's prior year member. I see I'm looking at all members, but um, it's in here somewhere. Child record. Level. Period. 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 Did, did, did you see it? Parallel period about about a year back now. So probably good probably a good time to mention there's MDX language and there's also another language I'll get into a little bit later. So I'm used to, I'm mixing my terms. Two questions now. Final question. Yes. So so that's a compare of two different periods. What about uh, being able to get a, a a running total based on certain parameters, uh, certain parts of the date? So whether it's uh, Sure. Running total for the year, for the quarter month, over quarter, week, month quarter. over month. Right. Yeah, same thing. So you just you just set the period or the, the prior uh, intersection yeah. or whatever level you want. So it could be year, it could be month, it could be a day. And kind of along the lines of the KPI. So if I go back to my KPI here, I have uh, a trend here. I, I didn't populate it, but I think I have it populated here. Yeah. So what is this? This is a trend showing me where uh, where I've been, so that would be the the month over month in this case, or day over day. You can actually do that and get the numeric value for it using KPI. I just put a visualization here. Um, I think I can change this really quickly for you, though. Maybe manage it to a um, maybe a bar graph would be a little easier. I can see the bottom of the screen. Like. Those are each month. So obviously I'm comparing month over month. I can now put a measure on top of it. Say, well, I'm here now. What does the quarter look like? Am I trending up? Am I trending down? Exactly. You know, that'd be quarterly bonuses. I always relate back to bonuses. To uh, yes. Oh, question. Uh, question is, what's the difference between processing and deployment? Rewrites everything when you deploy. Processing has different options. There's a full process, a partial process, an update process. It's basically, and that's a good question because I kind of I rolled over that. Uh, um, you can process different dimensions if you're making updates to only a certain part of your, your multi-dimensional queue. If you think of a large enterprise with multiple fact tables, this is an overly simplistic uh, demo. Um, if I had 10 fact tables, 10 different tables, 30 different dimensions, I don't want to take the entire queue offline. I might want to process only a few dimensions at a time. That's where those processing options come in, where I can refresh, change the code on a couple dimensions, uh, and not take it offline. Hopefully that explains it. If not, just what the other thing. So, so let's look at. Okay. So let's look at why. Uh, I still love cubes. How many people here work for their finance department? Finance? Anyone in finance? Anyone in charge of budgeting? Budgeting? FTNA? Has everyone heard about that? Financial planning? I'm going to budget my next year. I'm going to forecast my sales. I'm going to change those sales. I'm giving a, let's say, a list. Uh, we probably have Excel sheets in our current companies. Um, I'm going to give an Excel sheet to each sales rep. They're going to say what their their pipeline looks like, their confidence of their pipeline, and give it back to me probably once a month. I'm going to take that data, 
put it in a larger Excel sheet, bring it up to the finance, the financial manager, the sales manager, uh, VP of sales, and say, here's, here's your pipeline, uh, go ahead and budget. We're, you know, we're, we're gonna make, we're gonna make Q3, we're not gonna make Q3. That's a huge process. Why don't we take the data, the sales data that we have already in our queue, allow the business users to dynamically change the data, have it automatically write back to the queue, but then the sales VP just to read off the data. Is that a lot simpler? Well, it's what we call a write back. So, if I go to partitions, and I am not gonna cover this much, because Kevin's gonna talk about partitioning later on. We have partitions. We have what we call a write back sale. So I have a sales back table, which is tracking gross sales, discounts, freight, et cetera, and I have a write back. So right off, right, right from the start, you can see that the data that I'm going to have in my queue and the data that I'm going to contribute to the queue will be stored in two different places. This is perfect for the actual versus estimated uh, debate. What I thought we're going to have for sales and what did we actually get for sales. Very, very fun dashboard to put in front of a, a sales vice president. So, how do we do this? Right back setting. And we simply click OK. And what it will do is it will actually go back to the database. In this case, it's being stored in the demo, so this will be our, our data warehouse. You can store it somewhere else if you prefer. And it's going to store it back. Uh, MoLab, I'll, I'll cover that in a minute. So when we click OK, I've already done it, so I'm going to skip that and go back to our table. We have a right back sales table. Now, initially this would not be as populated, uh, but I've been uh, experimenting with this. What do I see? I have a sales back table. I have a right back sales table. Values are the same. I have a gross sales, discount, freight, product, sales rep. My intersection in my queue with the, with the metrics I'm tracking, I have the date SK, that's the end date, and then I have some auditing information. So I know when the change was made and who made the change, so you can see my usernames right here. Very nice. How do we use it? Well, let's switch over to Excel right now. And let's start looking at this cube that we built. So let's put everything on hold, circle back. If I come into Excel, and I, I actually think I have an existing connection, and I go to Analysis Services, I'm going to connect to my data cube. You can see my local host demo sales demo. I'm going to put my third chart in. I now can see all the work we've done, the dimensions, the uh, measures, the percent of sales that calculation we did, the KPI, sales performance, the date hierarchies, product hierarchies, et cetera. So from an end user standpoint, this is the first thing they'll see is this pivot table. Most business users are very comfortable with Excel, so we take advantage of it. They just want to drag in their data. I want to see what my sales were by sales rep. They can click on the hierarchy for sales rep. Uh, Billy Stone is our vice president, I believe, our director. And we want to see our sales. So I'm going to bring in gross sales. And I want these by date. I'm going to bring my date hired. My comps. Done. Question before was about filtering, selectivity, parameterizing. You can do it here, too. I can just use this as a filter. You know, I want to say, um, Come down sales rep. Maybe my manager, I want to have a slicer. I only want to see sales for, uh, maybe I'm Randy. I want to see my sales. Done. So we did a lot of prep work to make our business users uh, a job a lot easier. I can expand into this. Yeah, add everyone back in. So I see Billy Stones are Director, we have our regional managers, and we have our sales rep in the name. I can expand the year and the month, January, February, March. How hard would this be to put into SSRS or a Power BI to do a spark line? The same thing I was trending up, we're trending down. Is February a good month for us? Is, is March a bad month? These are now questions that we have data exposed that we can easily answer with a simple visualization tool, which I'll get into with a Power BI. So that would see the roll-up capabilities here. We're making the job easier for our business users. So a couple of examples I've put together. Um, kind of the same thing here. I did a totals. 
We have our sales reps totals by month. Um, we have our key performance, which we've already seen. So this one is my bonus, the uh, bonus dashboard. Um, who do we say? Jose is getting a bonus. And I'm talking to Robert tomorrow. So, um, oh, actually, no, I'm going to have Robert's red now. So very useful. Could I put this in a Power BI, expose this to an um, online interface, put it on a sales manager's cell phone with Power BI? Absolutely. So he's... He's on a lunch break and he just wants to see how we're doing. He scrolls through his phone and goes, I guess, you know, I'm going to congratulate Jose. I'm going to talk to Robert when I get back. Shoot me an email right now. Do I want to see um, a report by product? Maybe I'm a, uh, a product manager. How are we doing? Golf accessories are, are doing excellent. Golfing's big. Outdoor protection? Hey, don't need that. Very useful information. Very quick. Let's drag and drop. It, it, and this is nothing new. It's the right back that's the big seller. Because now I can take this in those open months in 2017, I, as a, maybe I'm in charge of iron sales, can go back and update this record, have it right back to the cube, so then anyone else can this report to see. Let's do that. Does that require sell 2016? No. I couldn't get that to work in 2010, and you have to have SQL Server Enterprise for right back. So you need to enable it on the uh, and you need to enable it on the permission um, right here. Uh, sorry. All right. <coughs> I do it on the I do it on the uh, visual uh, visual studio side. There it is, right back. Just so I enabled it there. Uh, right back. I had clients on thirteen. <laughs> we used it. Maybe it's permissions inside analysis service. Uh, okay, so when you create that table in Visual Studio. You need to have BBO permission right back to that warehouse, which is a big, which is a big thing. Service accounts. That's the way I get around. Uh, we have a service account that no one ever logs on as, but now SQ processes as. You probably use the same thing for any endpoint SQL Server right now. Um, what SQL engine's running under is fine. Um, whatever that current policy is, but uh, I use service accounts. I know their permissions at the admin level on the server. You don't have your laptop. Happy to look at it afterwards. Um, so let's do this. Let's let's let's, uh, let's uh, write back some data here. So back in Excel, we have OLAP tools, and we have what if analysis. We need to enable what if analysis, which I've already done. And then what we should do is look at settings. Now, I might be getting a little ahead, but I'm going to update a cell here. I'm going to update first date. Well, this is a roll-up, so it's going to affect outdoor protection on the year, right? If I was to look at, um, let's go back to sales rep, actually. It's probably a little easier to understand. Follow along here. So set it. Now, if, if, if I make a change, I'm a sales rep. I'm, I'm a Jose, good sales rep. And I'm going to put a change in August. Well, that's going to roll up to my director, Randy. It's going to roll up to Billy. And they want to see that. Well, how do I want that spread out? That's the question we're asking. There's some options here. Do I want to allocate the value entries divided by the number of allocations? So if I have 12 periods and I change my total year period, my estimation of 2017 to $1,000, do I want to go across all 12 months? Do I want to spread vertically uh, going down? Or do I want to increment based on the old value? So increment based on the old value. If I'm 1000 and uh, someone else is $500 and I increase the grand total, I get a bigger proportion because I was originally a thousand dollars. So there's some um, some intelligence here uh, when we're entering. Typically, it's what I have selected. We're going to put a number in. It's going to spread vertically, not horizontally, because you have to do macros for that. Um, and we're going to do the uh, allocation equal, so it's going to be spread even. Additionally, I also have the first option automatically. So whenever I type something in, it automatically adjusts the screen. Does that mean it's committed? 
back to the cube? No, but I can see it on the fly. So as I make changes, I want my report to change, but not necessarily commit back to the cube yet. So it's, again, what if? So let's go ahead and type some numbers in. Uh, let's put, uh, who did I say it was, Jose? Let's say uh, we're in February. February sales are looking good. I'm going to put $1,000 in here. And you can see what instantly happens as I rolled up to uh, Randy and talked about how to have Billy. Who was our who was our least performing sales rep? Does anyone remember? Robert. Robert does fifty dollars this month. Robert's flagging. Uh, Richard's doing um, two thousand March. Rob, uh, Robert is doing seventy five big space. And um, I forecast fifteen hundred dollars. My report changes. I could save this off, send it to my, my team or, or to Randy, say, here's what my forecasts are, what do you think? Um, but when I'm ready, I can I can publish this. Now, we also have some other options here before I publish. Let me uh, grab this little icon here. I can discard change. I can replace the value with what it was there before. Uh, so I can go backwards. Again, this is not committed until you publish. <coughs> So let's publish this data. OLAP tools, what if analysis, publish changes. And again, I'm going to cross my fingers because I don't think I broke the cube uh, when I did that on the fly. <coughs> there it goes, published. Everyone else can see this data. Wonderful. So I got my FTNA. I'm, I'm coding in my, my sales. I could have done this on the product list. Maybe, um, maybe I want to change unit costs. Maybe we're going to increase the price. Or, yes. So, in your previous uh, options for when you're doing the update, is it an uh, update based on old values? Mm -hmm. Previous that, values. Or previous yeah. values? Does that mean that if you were at the sales rep level and you were to go in and put the regional vice president and say, all right, it's 150 million last year. I want to be at 175 this year. Does it then allocate those funds based on the previous year's performance of each? No, it's on the previous value that was in that cell. Okay. So um, this is free. Some limitations. Now there's other competitors out there for right back up DNA. I like this. This this works for a lot of my customers. It's simplistic enough where we can make those changes. We don't need a front end app, um, but there is some additional. Uh, Enterprise functionality you can get elsewhere for a price. This is free. Now, if you refresh this right now, is it going to reflect the changes you made over on the sales rep? I already did. We're, this is a product tab. I, sorry, I got, I got stuck halfway in a thought. Um, sales rep is what we did. <coughs> sorry there. Because I... But no, will, will it carry the, the product view? If you refresh that, will those changes come through allocated across products? If this was built for product by sales rep. So I broke those out. I had sales rep forecast and product forecast. I didn't I didn't marry the two yet to say sales rep's going to sell these products, but it would. What that would have to be then is the hierarchy. So we have a hierarchy by sales rep here. I would maybe uh, maybe Jose to charge this off us. I think there was the, the biggest selling item in our, our our fake company. Maybe that's why he's doing so well. So maybe I have a product and then who's selling them. So then I can say, well, I'm going to uh, maybe uh, iron Jose and Richard are selling. I'm going to say I'm going to sell more iron. Oh, they going to sell more so would actually increase the, the product line. So it all comes back to those hierarchies, how we're rolling things up. Right now, they're split. So we've entered this data. Let us go look at it in a nice visualization. And by nice, I mean simple demo. Now, this is Power BI. This is Microsoft's uh, uh, latest latest visualization tool. I've literally just connected this up to my analysis queue and my uh, write back table. So my analysis cube is row sales, row sales revised is my uh, write back table. I now can see uh, green row sales and black is new row sales. Am I increasing or am I decreasing based on my, on my forecast? This is, is tremendously important for um, Budgeting AOPs, anyone do their AOPs, anyone that has a hand in AOPs, anyone operating upper end plans, huge. Am I trending to what I budgeted in November of 15, oh, sorry, we six, 17 now, in, in 16, 
am I trending along those lines? Am I actually going, is my curve going above those? Am I going to meet goals? This is your Vice President of Sales, your VP of Finance, your C-suite discussion topics right here in one nice little graph. Yeah. So when you are entering the data, <laughs> yeah, let's say um, let's say Randy said, "Hey, um, in September, fifty thousand. So going back to those settings, I think that's what you meant, right? Yeah. Kind of. Okay, clarify in a minute. Yeah. yeah. So we have fifty thousand. That was that equal spread. So for every record, it will spread even. So uh, it might mean. Perfect. So at the very beginning, we talked about those four steps, one of them being the grain, the fact, the fact table. You would have, and it doesn't mean you have to have one or the other. You can have both. You would have another fact table, not this one's called sales. You would maybe have manager sales, and you can write back at that level. And that completely separates you from um, item up. It's a great question. You, you can have multiple fact tables in a, in a dimensional model. I only have one for simplicity, but that's exactly right. That's a higher grain for reports. That's a great point. Yes? You create multiple scenarios with this. So let's say I want to forecast, and I want to forecast a scenario based on what I know today. But then next week, I'd say, well, what if I do these numbers? Can I then compare my two scenarios? Yeah. So there's a couple ways to tackle that one. See, this is, I like the interactivity now. We're starting to get some really good questions here. These are things I'm seeing. We have an audit time. When I make a change, I have a time when that was created. Now, could I use this with the user ID to say this was my um, 214 sample versus my 213? Sure. Because what it does is that when you make a change, it, rec it records every record at that time scale. So I could use this as my um, version snapshot, I guess. Would it be easier for me to do that in traditional data warehousing with an ETL? Yes. Could I do it here? Yes. Would I, would I personally? No. Um, I would do snapshots, a snapshot replication or something like that. I'd have, have, have the right back table, always grab the most recent, just so it doesn't continually grow. I'd truncate it. I'd say, well, here, here's what we thought last yesterday, the way we went. Because then I would put that in a fact table and have my forecast versioning over two, three, four, five years. One right back table. I treat this almost like an ODS. Any other questions? Do we have one more? How do you uh, prevent users to put into that? Yeah, so that's another great question. So this is my demo data. And I'm glad you caught it, but, I'm, but, but I, was, I was being a little lazy last night. Um, I would have different fields. I would have different backends. So if, if in my dimensional model, I might have fact sales. And I might have a uh, fact forecast. The right back would be on the forecast table. And I might even use a view so the user doesn't see that difference to say, okay, well, if it's before current date, or probably current month, we probably close every month. Before the first of the current month, grab from actuals. If it's the current month or four, grab from forecast. If it's three, four, five months out, grab from AOP. So you can do that and you could, you could encapsulate to hide from the users, but um, partitioning is going to be coming up soon. Um, and, and, and that right back uh, partitioning is where, uh, where we're looking at. So this is the right back table. Yes? Yeah. Also, there can be some calculations. So instead of just directly entering some other amounts, you might be adding some things and some statistics. Cool. Modifications. So all those calculations would be happening. And I, still or I would not take that too far. Um, I would enter the end value. Now, if you want to have it, it is Excel. So if you want to have a macro or some uh, expressions off to the side that are calculate some data for you, sure. But I think the actual process of updating that cell, I would keep manual. And, and for the most part, 80% AB20 rule, that, that fits what my clients need. Uh, if you want to talk about that further, I have, I have some other tool sets I can mention to you, although, of course, I'm going to rest on this one. Any other questions? Yes. And this is only multi-dimensional with more tabular? Yeah. Good question, too. See, I was going to get to tabular. Yeah. So uh, the question was, is this only for multi-dimensional or for right back? Tabular, I believe, is coming. It might be. Uh, I could do a quick Google search. 
but it is coming. Um, some additional things. Basically, what we're looking at here is we have multidimensional, which we walked through today, which was very disk-based. We're going to read off disk. We're going we're to we're write the disk. We're going to query. We're going to pre-aggregate and let the user uh, <clears throat> benefit from that pre-aggregation. Tabular model is another version of SSAS. It's not a cube. It's literally like an old rollout where you're joining uh, the tables. I'm, I'm joining my sales rep. I'm joining products. I'm joining sub uh, subcategory, category, and sales. So it's, it's very ERP look and feel, but under the covers it does the same thing. The way it does that is in memory compression. I asked earlier the early say about uh, vertipax, column store indexing. That's how it does it. Plus 10 to 1 compression, very useful. I use it for experimental levels. So if I build an enterprise multidimensional queue for the company, I might then go to department heads and offer a tabular model. Does anyone use Power Pivot in Excel? It's, it's the same thing. It's just now your enterprise level and not Excel level. Does that, that make sense? So the question was, Will it have right back? It might even on here have it now. I just haven't checked recently. Um, some additional things that uh, multidimensional and tabular have different translations. Uh, we didn't cover that today, but I mean, it's, it's literally a sentence. Um, I can literally go through my cube and for each one of my column headers, put different language labels on them. So where it's an international company, um, I could have the word for sales in English and in Spanish. Uh, German, um, I can do that translation for my customers so they can understand the, uh, understand the uh, Excel pivot table in their native language, translations. Sounds very, um, uh, sounds very powerful, but really what you're doing is you're literally just typing different column names for different, different fields. That was something that Tabula didn't have. I think they have it now, though. Other questions? We have about 15 minutes. So, what's the end goal of this? The end goal is to make reporting. Oh, grab. Um, In your base system, right? Can that be done with right back? No, because right back's really looking at the measures. Those those fields that we update were the measure is the, the gross sales measure. In, in your case, I apologize, I can't. This is a unable to build some document. It's Ariel. <laughs> um, in your case, I mean, I've had I've had cases where we've had third party data or. Uh, you know, departments that want to write data into a record that's in the ERP that doesn't have those columns. That, that sounds like what you're after. You're trying to add detail to a record that doesn't have it in your, your source system. So in that case, the first thing I would recommend is can you modify the source system? Microsoft Dynamics is really good at this. We can add columns. Infor, I believe, can add columns very easy. Bond can, Orful, and I think those are, those are the big ones. Um, if that's not possible, we used to have a tool called Light Switch for a um, front end uh, rapid application development that's kind of gone by the wayside now, replaced by Access News. You can create a view <coughs> to write into a warehouse or an ODS to mimic that process. Now, I would always urge caution when you're creating a ERP bolt on that doesn't <coughs> actually tie to your ERP. Um, but you can do it. Excel, Excel's been used multiple times to write 
just just using DBA code right into a table, and then put the reporting on top of it. Kind of what I'm doing. So he has to create the attribute first, give it his name, mm -hmm. it puts in the attributes, essentially the choice of the table, and then he can apply it to a job. Mm -hmm. But I know I'm not doing it as much as way. Talk about after with you if you like. I, I, I've had cases where I've, I've congratulated a client because they wrote an Excel application <coughs> that was literally an ERP. And I, and I told the developer, I go, I am amazed at what you've done. <coughs> let me tell you why we shouldn't do that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I, I, I can talk about some options. So this is the end goal, this dashboard. Putting it on the dashboard, putting it on the website, and I told you I'll show you on my phone, um, is the end goal. I want my users to be able to grab data, click on a field, uh, maybe if I shift, let's just do the shift here, it's night, night shift. See the PPM, so anyone that's in uh, process manufacturing knows what this value is. They want to, they want to, parts, parts per million, yeah, quality, quality check. So I want my user to get this. Lots of layers, we built the report, we built the right back, we built the queue, we dimensionally model our RFP system, but we did a pretty quick one today. Last night it took me a couple hours just to throw together my laptop. Um, a great advantage. So, I know this is a deep dive, and I went very fast. I want to show you the end goal with the right back. You can learn the uh, specifics on the design afterwards. <laughs> I want to show you where, where the uh, the light down looks like. Questions? Do you have either on or on page for any handouts for this? I don't. I can get some. Uh, I can give you my card. <laughs> um, yeah, Microsoft is very good. Um, let me pull this up here. Very good at online documentation. Uh, PowerBI.com, I'll just let that pop. Uh, learning, guided learning documentation. I personally follow uh, a few of the blogs, um, the lead developers. Um, I'm on their email distribution list, so I see those updates. And that's why I knew about that technical release where now we can embed Power BI into native mode SSRS on prem. That was a big deal. It's still technical release. It doesn't come out until middle of the, uh, June, July ish. But uh, very big. Instantly took that to one of my customers that have been looking for it. Made their day. Great documentation, powerbi.com. User groups are very strong. Uh, if you want, you, you can email me. You know, I'll, I'll give you the list I, I follow. Question? Yes, what was that? 2016? Power BI is independent. Uh, you, it's free. You download the desktop client. You can connect to uh, numerous sources. You can pull this up for you. Uh, here are the sources. We have Excel, CSVs, XML, folder. Um, there's an AD option here. I'm, I'm talking to a um, security network security admin about using AD to see who's in what groups. Um, Teradata, MySQL, IBM 2, DB2, that used to be a you know a hard point for a SQL server guy to make that connection, no longer. Uh, Azure, web, OData, uh, I'm using that tremendously with Dynamics now, everything's on the web, I'm using OData connections. Dynamics 365, Facebook, you name it, they're adding it right now. And they're adding things monthly, weekly at some times. We use, uh, we've been playing with this thing about the ERP system. Yep. And so there is a VW connector here, but we have performance issues with connecting to us AP with yep. standard working on team shops. Yep. Do you see any performance issues doing this? So we export the data from SAP um, onto a either a VM or a, an Azure SQL box or an on-prem server and then pull from that. So we use uh, well, I'll talk to you after. Yeah. We uh the O data is the same thing right now. Depending on where that uh, server is stored, the data is a little slow because it's, it's, it's on the internet now. It's like the old API calls we used to go with. Um, it's, there's a lot coming. Um, and trust me on that one. I, I, I'm on these phone calls with some of the de developer teams. Um, a lot of good things I'm excited about. Um, and you'll see it here as soon as they have it released. You'll see it on the technical previews. You can enjoy it like, like a camera. Any other questions? Yeah. 
memory. Uh, so, so let's. So you have multiple, multiple decisions here. Uh, I had a billion dollar company that when I was working full time, we used tabular model. Uh, I have had a company that maybe 50 gigs of data, use multi-dimensional. So data, data size, to some extent. Server memory, tabular uses memory compression. So you're talking 192 gigs, something like that, depending on what server you have. Additionally, um, you can do more functionality in multi-dimensional still. Just, we mentioned uh, right back and calculations. Um, there's some additional features that only are multi-dimensional, not tabular. Um, but tabular is the latest and greatest. It's what power pivot it was. It's quick to develop. It, it, it doesn't use MDX language. It uses a different language. It's very Excel-ish, Excel-formed, so it's very quick to implement. Um, if you came to me and asked which one to use, I would first ask you what your goal is. Oh, is this for a department? Is this for multiple departments? Is this enterprise? Um, what's your uh, skill skill set uh, in, the, in the department? Um, what's your turnaround time? Are there any features that you have to use multidimensional for? If not, then it's a coin toss. Uh, I like that going to Right back, though, and I am going to find out about that. But you know already? Um, I'm interested. Um, uh, you know, I use multi for the right back. Now, if Tabula has that, it just made my life a lot harder. Any other questions? Yes. So this is really cool uh, view of things. If, if you were stuck with having to deploy that, you know, via SharePoint, SSRS, or whatever, on a web page, and you've got JavaScript problems, you know, we have issues with speed of refresh and not being able to control the refresh when the user hits any button on the page. So that the, just ruins, you know, your whole swing. <coughs> no, of course not. Of course not. Yeah, let me upload the turn it off. Should be uploaded. So, refresh on SSRS. You have SSRS reports, and you have the Power BI desktop reports. SSRS, you can schedule refreshes, as you're aware. Power BI, you can't, except now the technical preview came out. So, talking general availability, if I deploy a Power BI to SSRS, when I click that icon, it's going to launch open the desktop client, which then I click refresh on. If I deploy to the web, um, let me ask, let me pull this up here. Actually, if I deploy to the web, I can use the data management gateway to refresh. So that that, that was a, a gap between on-prem and cloud that's now being resolved in the next five six months. We have the technical preview right now. If you have the option to put in the put in the PowerBI.com, that's where I I would push this because there's more functionality up here. Uh, let me show you. Uh, we, we were talking about IoT earlier. So here's an IoT demo I put together. This is streaming data from Seattle uh, with, um, I think it's just weather. I think it's just junk data, but it's streaming. So I have the ability to do this on the web. I can't do this on the ground yet. We're working on it. I've had some clients that can't deploy their data to the, to the, uh, the internet, the, the cloud, because of security constraints, federal laws, um, working through those issues. So I think we're having a lot to talk about after this meeting, I feel like. Other questions? That's it. One minute to spare. Good time. I will be here um, after about 15 minutes. If anyone has any questions or wants to talk and get some links, um, thank you for joining me. Let me speak. Hopefully, it wasn't too fast. I want to throw everything out. Thank you. 
need of development. Unfortunately, our I 
I have no problem doing that. I <laughs> uh, want to get everybody home early. <laughs> um, so my topic is purchasing strategy. Uh, I naturally have a loud voice, so it booms into the microphone to tell me. Um, so my name is Kevin Shear. I have a human biology degree. Talk about like before. Um, I started building websites and assembling my own computers at college, and that's how I got into IT. So, um, first programming language I touched was PHP and MySQL, found um, free BSD server, from there moved on to SV.NET SQL and started doing web based applications. Um, became an enterprise application developer and got into this talk. At the time I got into this talk, I really got into SSIS. Uh, I just love how those two tools complement each other, uh, can accomplish some some best integration uh, work that we can do. So all in all, I have 15 years in databases now, MySQL, Oracle, Informatica, uh, of course, Microsoft SQL. 